Welcome once more to History of Saps, Blackjacks, and Slungshots. And today we get to see our second Native American weapon in the series. I'm really excited to see this, because it's the first time I've seen this variation. Uh, the shorthand name for this is the Flophead, because it does a good job of describing the motion of the stone load. The one in my collection is more of a true slung shot, and this is kind of like a proto-blackjack. So in short, Native American weapon makers produced flexible clubs, bludgeons, where you had a stone encased in animal hide, usually buckskin, that had a connection, long or short, it could be a rope or animal hide, which was then attached to a rigid shaft. So it's a sap, right? It's a rock sap. Rock saps being used uh, in Europe, incidentally, uh, for ages, from like the Middle Ages and uh, to later than you would think. There was a weapon called the Galloway Flail, that maybe I'll do a video on if I can ever get some kind of visual to, uh, to associate with it. And that was from, you know, centuries and centuries later. So if you recall, or if you're watching this video first, then the main difference here between saps in general and these are that these are weapons of war, right? This is not a personal self-defense, you know, s street weapon, if you will. It's, it's basically a soldier carrying this. The other big difference is that, of course, Native American weapons, one of the things that makes them so fascinating is uh, they're so artistic. So you've got those beads there. This one is, is the worst for wear, clearly. <laughs> but, you know, you've got different colors. You've got beads. The beads have different colors. Uh, it's kind of amazing the work that they would put into something that was going to be used as just an instrument of all-out, you know, combat. And it was really all parts, you know, even the striking head, which how crazy is that? So you can see the remnants of the beads at the top of the striking head here. And I love how this uses a really spherical stone, too. Now look at that connection. Look how thin that is. So when you, check out this view. Again, look at that connection. You can see there's actually two different bands that are connecting the stone to the shaft. And that's it. It's just so odd to me. There's, uh, you know... So what fascinates me about this weapons category in general applies here as well. There's just much simpler ways to go about, you know, coming up with a, an effective basher. But uh, there's something about saps. You have these multiple connections, and, you know, the flexible connection is a weak point, and it doesn't look like it's wide enough or strong enough to hold on to the, the striking head. You know, my Victorian fruit kosh, which you guys might have seen the video on, same thing. You look at it, and it just kind of looks crazy, and uh, I love that. So here's the shaft, which this thing got carried, I would say, for sure, because it's basically in tatters. This was a common technique. Uh, the wood would generally be covered in buckskin or whatever, and then that would be painted, decorated, got the beads on it, all kinds of stuff. So it's really incredible. Uh, there's some highly decorated versions where there's not a square inch that's not covered in multicolored beads, but this one to me looks more functional yet decorated, kind of like the one that I own. If you look at the bottom of the screen there, you can see the stress line that was caused by this thing flopping back and forth as it's meant to. Uh, and that's going to be a natural thing, right? So again, these are odd weapons, and they, they require attention and care, and you've got to be careful, because if that stone goes flying off the shaft, you're going to look pretty stupid, uh, you know, right before you die. So I love this picture. It's just That encapsulates these weapons for me, especially this version of the Native American one. It's I'd seen it before. I'd seen pictures of them. It's a flat connection, right? So it's not like a rope. I would think it would swing best along one axis then, if you, if you catch my drift, right, I'll, you know, whereas if you swing it against, you know, perpendicular to the the plane caused by that flat animal hide there, I think it might not swing as effectively. I, it probably wouldn't matter. I think it would just kind of flop around, but that's an odd way to go about it as well. I, I thought that was strange. Usually a connection, think of like a chain or like a rope on an achaco or a chain on a flail, whatever. It, it's, it's more omnidirectional. So a little close up, you can see the remnants of the paint. Not much left to it at all. The other thing here was that the beads are really, really tiny, and I kind of really hadn't seen that before. And one of the noticeable things about this specimen in particular is that almost like perfectly spherical stone. I think that's great. And notice the stitching here. You can see the lines. You can see where it comes together. can't be easy to stitch leather or whatever on top of kind of a perfectly round object and have it just be on their skin tight. So usually a method, at least from other places, I think like in South America with the bola or bolas, which has a very similar look, uh, you take the leather when it's still wet, get it around there, do your stitching, and as it would dry, it would shrink and really form that tight, tight connection. 
now let's not forget to talk martial arts. The short connection here really changes the weapon if you compare it to the, the previous video, where it has a long rope and it's just like a medieval flail. And it's going to get used that way and that long rope can wrap around an opponent's shield or their arm if they put it up for a guard, and you can still strike home. This does not give you that connection, obviously, uh, that possibility. It gives you much less of a swinging arc, so it's not going to help you really get around anything, but it serves the primary purpose, which is, of course, to make it hit harder, like with all of our weapons. But it's not all downside. You know, that connection of just a few inches also means you can recover from a miss much more easily. Right? Big, long, flexible weapon. Once you miss, you're kind of in trouble, and you have to be really skilled at reinitiating momentum or preserving what you've got, bringing it back around in, a, in kind of a wide arc. You don't need that here. You just reverse course with that wooden shaft and bring it back around. Final note is, it's interesting that these are forgotten within, you know, the popular imagination when it comes to Native American warriors, the same way that saps, blackjacks, and slung shots are largely forgotten and misunderstood when it comes to, you know, European and American fighters in the West. These were used, they were used a lot, but you just don't think of it. You think of a, you know, you ask somebody to think of a, you know, a Native American or Indian warrior, and what are they going to think of? A tomahawk, bow and arrow, maybe a lance, that kind of thing. But these were part of the panoply, and uh, they were feared for a reason. Thanks as always.